hello and welcome to my session, Leveraging Reddit's V6 Tracking for Awesome Client Side Caching. My name is Ben Malik. Uh, I'm a principal engineer at Paylocity. We are an online payroll and human capital management provider. And we started using Redis uh, probably four or five years ago, at, originally as an ASP.NET session state store. And we branched into using it for caching and eventually got to a kind of a nifty solution that was a mix of Redis and uh, client-side caches. And I had actually presented uh, what we were doing at RedisCon uh, 2018. And I thought the presentation went fairly well, although the first person that came up to me after the, uh, the presentation, they, their question they had for me is, is exactly why were you doing all this? So I, I realized that I, I didn't do a good job of explaining the problem we were trying to solve. So hopefully I'll rectify that this time around. So here we go, we have a, a fairly typical website. Um, we've got several uh, web servers sitting behind a load balancer. We'll say the whole, the, all of this is being driven by a SQL backend. And beyond the SQL backend, we also end up putting um, a bunch of client-side caches, just in-memory caches on all the, the web servers. And the reason we do this is there's lots of data that, that say we, we re display this data quite a bit, doesn't change that often. And we really don't wanna make the trip and, and throw the load onto SQL to pull back these values over and over again that are needed to render the pages every time. And this, this works pretty good. Again, I would assume this is a pretty, uh, pretty common scenario. Everyone's kind of shaking their head. Yep, we, we know what's going on. Well, if you know what's going on, you also understand this problem. So let's say we we're displaying that name, uh, the username in the, on the web page, and the user decides to change their name. So they're going to make a request. It's going to go through load balancer. It's going to get assigned to one of the web servers. That web server will update the SQL backend with the new name, and they'll, they'll also update their client-side cache. So the next time there's a request uh, for that value, we're going to present them with the new correct value. There's a problem with this because so web server two in this example has the correct value in the client side cache. All the other web servers have stale values. So if a request goes to any of those other web servers, it's going to, it's going to basically return the wrong value. Now, there's a couple of different solutions we can use or we can attempt to use to, to solve this problem. Uh, one which I'm a little familiar with because uh, I've seen other companies try to do this is what's what's just broadcast an update. So if web server two receives the update, we're going to broadcast the key and value to the rest of the web servers and say, hey, here's the key that changed. Here's the new value. Put in your client side cache and everything will be good. But it turns out that it really isn't a, a good solution. Um, one, every, every time I've seen this, uh, this approach used, it's always flooded the network with synchronization traffic. There's just, there's just too much data going around to too many web servers and just the entire network bogs down. Um, the other problem that creates these, these really kind of insidious bugs because although TCP, say we're, we're, we're broadcasting these messages through TCP, um, TCP guarantees you won't lose packets and the packets will arrive in order, but they don't give you any guarantee that say if two web servers uh, do, they basically update the same value at very near the same time, there's no guarantee that the last writer actually will be the last uh, sync message sent to a client. So say one and two are, are updating things, uh, updating the same value. Web server two is the last one to actually write the value. So it, it wins. Well, there's no, there's no guarantee that web server three will receive web server two sync message last. And that causes just really hard to debug um, problems where you can't understand why certain web servers are serving up the wrong data. You know, it's not real obvious. So there's a couple of different solutions to this. Uh, one of my favorite is, you know, we could just dump, we could dump the client side cache all together and just replace it with Redis. And this, this is a very, very common solution. Uh, it really, for, for many different scenarios, it's a great solution. Um, Redis is very fast. It's, it's faster than any other network driven backend. Um, you solve any race conditions or consistency problems because we have one source of truth, which is Redis, and all the web servers will always be looking, um, will always be going to Redis to get the latest and greatest value. So they're always serving up the correct value. In cases where we have multiple web servers um, updating, updating a value at a similar time, again, 
whoever writes last to Redis is going to be the winner. And that's what all the other, um, all the other web servers will get and serve up for their data. But there's one, one, one little catch though, is every time you do a Redis access, you're actually doing a TCP round trip, right? Because we need to traverse the network to actually get the value from Redis. And, and, there are some cases where there's data that you need that you actually just need faster than you can get across the network. So Redis is, you're, you're probably looking at probably sub millisecond times to retrieve data. But if you need to retrieve, you know, dozens of values, that starts adding up to now and okay, now we've got 20 or 30 milliseconds of time that's used basically transit traversing the network to get Redis. And, and memory is it's, it's, it's an order of magnitude, you know, Rams an order of magnitude faster than the network. And like I say, there's, there's certain data where that just won't be fast enough. So what if, what if we had a, a hybrid solution? What if uh, instead of broadcasting uh, change data to all the, all the web servers, instead we also we had client-side caches, we also had Redis. And um, whenever an update occurred, we would update Redis, and then we would just updated or we would uh, broadcast an invalidation message to the rest of the web, web server saying, hey, this key has changed. The next time you need this value, why don't we go to Redis? And that was the basis of what I was presenting at, at Redis Conf 18. Um, the real key here is that for this caching solution, Redis is always the source of truth. If there's any question about what value is the correct value to, to serve up in the cache, you go to Redis, it has the correct value. Um, Kind of like to describe before, when the cache value is updated, we write that value to Redis, and then we we uh, leverage Redis pub sub to broadcast a message to all the clients saying that, hey, this, this this key is updated again. Next time someone requests it, don't serve it up from your local client cache. Go to Redis, get the correct value. Uh, and it really it really was a, a best of both worlds solu uh, solution. It, it had very good speed. Um, uh, the consistency was very good because, again, we were, we were syncing all these client-side caches with Redis. And, and the, thing is, the thing that's great about Redis is e even if you have a client-side miss, you know, it's not like we're going, making a web API call or executing some complex query in SQL to get the proper value back. You know, that even in case of a client cache miss, it's only about a millis uh, my, millisecond, excuse me, to get the data out of Redis. Um, and we actually at, at Payless, we went, we went a step further. I, I was uh, very, very concerned about uh, uh, the amount of network traffic just because of bad experiences with sync messages. So we don't actually broadcast the key. We would actually broadcast the hash of the key. So this means regardless of our key size, we always had a fixed size, very small synchronization message that we'd send around. So we minimized the, the network traffic. Um, but the cost of that was that there was a lot more client complexity because now when when you would uh, send out this invalidation message, it would essentially invalidate all of the keys that that hashed to that same value. So you know, there's a little bit of trickery we had to do on the client end to actually make all that work. So I'm going to go off on a little tangent here, but uh, I've actually only only spoken with uh, Salvatore a few times. Uh, mainly at Redis Conf, where you know I'd run into him in the hallway and I'd have some question uh, for him, you know, which I'd present what I needed, and and he'd always come up with the answer nice and quick. And one one of the things you, you pick up real quick with the Salvatore is is one he can grasp your problem very quickly. He can also uh, he can evaluate the solution that you're you're using and, and and give you the strengths and the weak points of of you know what you're trying to do. And this is this is kind of a double-edged sword because I have been in in, in uh, uh, sessions at Redis Camp where uh, Salvatore is in the audience, and you know if, if the presenter starts going off and and uh, so starts saying the wrong things, I mean he has Salvatore has no problem standing up and saying no, you're wrong. So when I was presenting, I was actually in in uh, I, I was actually very nervous that you know in the middle of my, my presentation, Salvatore was just going to stand up and just say you know no, this is all right, you're doing everything wrong. So anyway, I'm I started my presentation and uh, my wife was in the audience, so I didn't notice it. But I was looking one way, talking to people, and my wife notices uh, Salvatore walk in and sit down. And I'm you know walking, talking to people, or basically presenting slides and looking around. And then I saw Salvatore, and I my wife said I just stopped for 
two seconds there. My jaw kind of down, like, oh boy, I'm in trouble now. But uh, the, the good news was, was uh, Salvatore had, uh, he, he liked the solution. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, sorry about that. Uh, Salvatore picked up on, on some of the uh, issues I had with my solution. So the, the problem, the, the main issues with what I'd come up with was, was one, these invalidation messages were all being generated on the application side. So essentially the, the, you know, if you did an update, it had to go through our application cache logic to actually brought, you know, to update Redis, update client side cache, and then broadcast this invalidation message. The, the net of that is that if, uh, if someone were to say, just go to the Redis instance and update a value, we would never know about it because it didn't come through our application thing. Uh, another another issue was that uh, each of our you know each of our cache clients they didn't know what keys the other cache clients were basically interested in. So whenever we ha we did an update, we just broadcast to everyone say, "Hey, this value change changed. I don't know if you're going to use if you had used it, you're going to use it, but I don't know otherwise. So I'm going to just send it out to everyone." And, and the, the the main thing that 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 uh, Salvatore we noticed is that you know this the whole solution could be better if Redis was helping some on the server side. And come at Redis Count 2020 and Redis v6, Redis now helps. So it's a new feature called Redis Client Tracking. Uh, it's a set, new set of commands that are implemented in Redis uh, version six. It is an opt-in model uh, where the Redis clients choose. If they want to participate with this or not, it's not a, a server side thing where I, oh, this Redis server is doing client tracking or not, you know, like a binary switch. It's rather each of the clients that connects to Redis can basically say, yes, I want to participate in client tracking or I don't. Uh, it has two modes, uh, default and broadcast, which we'll go over in the next few slides. And, and the key to all of this is that, that Redis keeps track of what clients have requested, what keys, and then when those keys are changed by whoever, it knows to send invalidation messages to all the clients who had requested that key in the past. So now this, this solves the issue of, say if I have several web servers that have never actually asked for a certain value, we're not gonna send them invalidation messages because we know, or we Redis knows whether or not they've actually asked for this in the past. Uh, and the whole idea with the invalidation messages is that when a client receives an invalidation message, it's going to evict that value from their client side cache. So the next read will look at the client side cache. Oh, the value isn't here. I'm going to go to Redis. I'm going to get the correct value, put in my client side cache, and everything will be good. So let's go over some of these commands. First, the most simple, uh, client tracking on. Now this will this will put the the Redis client into uh, the default mode client tracking. And when you're in default mode, the, the key of that is, is what I was explaining where um, Redis is keeping track of every single client that's also participating in client tracking that uh, has requested keys. So then if there is a, uh, an update to that, the value associated with the key, we'll send the, broad, the um, invalidation message. So the pro part of this, this solution is that it is incredibly uh, effective or efficient as far as network resources, we're not sending any um, we're not sending any invalidation messages to clients that they don't care about this value. They either haven't requested it or they're not participating in client tracking. The con of this approach is that now Redis has to um, uh, keep track of all the clients that have requested a key. And when I was uh, Salvatore and I were first kind of talking about this. He, you know, he had some some very efficient ways to store this data, um, but the truth is, you know, when when you start having to, uh, an application where you have thousands and thousands of Redis clients, and you have, you know, it's not uncommon to have millions of keys. So if I've got, you know, a thousand thousand Redis clients, each one requesting fifty thousand keys, there is a heck of a lot of of data to actually keep track of. So basically, it's going to be a higher memory amounts on, on the Redis uh, server side. Now, the other, the alternative mode is broadcast mode. And the command is very similar. It's client tracking on bcast. So broadcast mode is really kind of the, the opposite of, of default mode. 
where default mode is keeping track of all the clients that um, that have requested a key. Broadcast mode, uh, broadcast mode, Redis doesn't store that at all. It just it just uh, basically keeps track of, of which clients are uh, have enrolled in client tracking, and when a value updates. Now we're going to uh, just basically broadcast an invalidation message to all the clients that are have uh, uh, signed up for client tracking. Um, pro on this, really no significant memory increase on the, on the Redis side. It's really just keeping track of which clients are, are interested in or have set up client tracking in broadcast mode. Uh, the con is, is that it's more network traffic because now we're sending invalidation messages to clients that may not be particularly interested in in the value that got updated um but some of that network traffic is, is mitigated because again we're, we're not sending values out we're just sending key names so as, as long as we don't go nuts and start saying hey we're going to have i'm going to make 50 megabyte keys which you can do in redis you know as long as you're not doing that you're actually in pretty good shape and your network packets or your your invalidation messages are going to be fairly small uh, another neat thing with broadcast mode is it has this concept of prefixes. So basically, you're, you're, when you turn client tracking on, you're doing broadcast, uh, bcast, and then prefix, and then you give it a key prefix value. So the whole concept with with key prefixes, when a client signs up for client tracking, they can basically say, "I'm interested in keys that start with certain values." So if you're smart about it, you can you can basically uh, uh, do your key names so the only invalidation messages come for keys that you're actually interested in and you're trying to store uh, in a client-side cache. Um, you can also specify multiple prefixes. You can just keep prefixing them the value, prefixing the value. And uh, it, it, another neat thing you can do with this is you can actually have a, have a, a, a system where where you can have some of your data being stored in the client side cache and some of it say say there's certain data we know is is either hot or it's you know very often accessed well we could we could then we could then add this uh to the key we could add this little pr uh, prefix and then when that we see that prefix then we'll store that in our client side cache we'll send it to uh redis using that key, same key with the prefix and now if there's any changes to that broadcast mode will uh send out invalidation messages just for for keys that have that prefix uh, not to leave default out mode out of this ability to to selectively decide what to uh, what to send in validation messages for or not uh, if we uh, with default mode there's an opt-in uh, option or basically when you set up client tracking you'll say client tracking on opt-in and when you say opt-in that means that that by default in this mode um, values I write to, uh, or when I, sorry, not write, but retrieving, because again, this is, is all based on, on who's retrieved stuff. So, uh, in opt-in mode, if I want to get a key and I want to receive invalidation messages for that in the future, I will actually send the command client caching. Yes. Get my okay response. And then I'll get, uh, get my key and I'll return a value. And now the next time that key updates, uh, is updated on the Redis server side. Redis will send a um, will send an invalidation message. So the opposite of this too, called opt out mode. So in opt in mode, you have to tell Redis uh, before you do a get to say, hey, I need to, uh, I want you to, I want you to send me an invalidation message if this data changes. Uh, in opt out mode, it's the opposite, and that you always, uh, unless you, unless you say client caching no. Every time you do a get, then Redis will keep track of that. So uh, track that key that you got. So the next time uh, that value is updated, it will send you an invalidation message. So two modes. The question is, is, is which do you use? And uh, it really, it, it depends. Uh, is really a balance of, you know, how important network synchronization traffic is versus how much memory do you want Redis to spend you know, not storing keys and values, but storing this other meta, this invalidation metadata. Um, and a couple things, a couple thoughts I had. Um, one, uh, you know, ask yourself the question, does your cache data change a lot? Um, you know, if it doesn't, 
and you're not sending many invalidation messages, then it's kind of silly to have, you know, Redis again, tracking thousands of clients, thousands of keys for invalidation messages that are actually never sent because um, the data never gets updated. You know, conversely, if, if you've got data that is uh, changing a, a fair amount, you know, very important to keep in sync. And so you, you want to make sure we get these invalidation messages out, especially have uh, a lot of clients to so say, you know, my examples are web farms, you know, 5, 10, 20 clients. That's not all that big. But, you know, if I have, you know, a thousand clients in my in my web farm or a thousand servers in my web farm and, and say that only a fraction of those really are going to be getting the updates for you know, whatever reason, then it probably default mode probably makes uh, a lot more sense. So a couple other little options we've got. Uh, it's one of my favorites. And this is this actually. Uh, as I was writing these slides, uh, the, uh, the client tracking was actually changing, so or, or the source code around it was changing, so the feature set was changing, so it was a little little tough keeping track of, of, of what was currently uh, going in. Um, so no loop is uh, no loop is a, uh, an option so that to basically tell Redis uh, do not send invalidation messages to the client that initiated the change. Um, and this is something we noticed with, with the old Paylocity caching solution, where um, uh, basically we would we would get a, we would um, you know get an update. We would update the local ca local client cache. We would update Redis. Then uh, Redis, and then we'd send out an invalidation message that went out to all all of the other clients, including ourselves. So what, what we were doing was we would write a value to our cache, we'd write the value to Redis, we'd, we'd broadcast an a, a invalidate message to everyone, and we'd catch that invalidation message and then immediately uh, evict the value from our cache. Um, I, I, I have to give credit to one of the teams at Paylocity because they were doing a bunch of um, performance testing and, and someone came to me and they said, they're like, yeah, it's really weird. It seems when we update a value in a cache, the next write or the next read is slow. And then all the subsequent reads are real fast. And, and he told me that, and I'm just, just like, no, you know, you're doing something wrong, but lo and behold, uh, now it, we were basically the, the writing node would actually invalidate itself, throw the value out of cache and then have to do a round trip to write the value. So our solution at the time then was we actually included the client ID in these invalidation messages. And then when a client would receive uh, an invalidation message, you would look to where, well, who originated this client message or this invalidation message. And if it was myself, I would actually just throw out the value. What's nice now, Redis does the work for me. I can just, just say, uh, just use no loop and I will not receive uh, updates that I initiated or you know my web server initiated. Uh, client tracking redirect, okay. So one of the interesting things here is is if you're using the RESP2, so you know which is the the protocol for the last few years uh, that Redis uses, if you try if you're in a RESP2 client and you turn client tracking on, you actually notice it doesn't do anything, and that's because RESP2 doesn't support push notifications, so, you know, it, and and uh, you know there's no way that Redis could can just in that same channel give you some type of uh, uh, invalidation message. So, so what the redirect option uh, does is it basically sets up uh, or basically configures an, an additional Redis client con uh, connection to receive these invalidation messages. So, and it works very much if you're familiar at all with PubSub. It works very, very similar to how if you ever. Uh, 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 a TCP connection to Redis, and you do a subscribe, all of a sudden that connection now, it's a push channel and you have very limited functionality you can do with it. it basically, you just use it to, um, you uh, use it to receive uh, pub sub messages. So if we want to do this with client tracking, what we'll want to do is we'll want to create a, a second connection to Redis. We're going to execute a client ID command so we can retrieve the, the ID of the client. And then we're going to do the subscribe Redis and validate and that will basically subscribe that channel to these invalidation messages. Now we go back to our, our main Redis connection and, and when we issue the client tracking uh, on command, we'll 
include the redirect and the client ID that we pulled from this other connection. So now when we do uh, updates, we will, when we do updates through the main, or actually really, when we're doing gets from the, um, the main Redis connection, if there's any updates to that key, we will receive invalidation messages um, uh, through the second channel. Um, one thing to be very careful with, and, and, and um, Salvatore has a, a very good example of this on his page on the, on the Redis website uh, about client tracking. And it, you can have race conditions because, again, with, with TCB connect, connections, you, there, there's feasible cases where, where you're updating a value and you actually, even though uh, you weren't the last person to write a value, you get that final OK from the Redis server. So you, to you, it looks like you've, you were the last writer to Redis, but actually in the meantime, you uh, had um, received an invalidation message from a client that updated the value after you did. It just you didn't get your OK reply in time. Speaking of RESP2, ah, RESP3. So um, one of the other things that, that Redis introduces with version six is, is an updated protocol, RESP3, um, which does support push notifications. Um, a client, uh, originally it was, the plan with Redis 6 was that we were, it was only going to support uh, RESP3. But over time, uh, quite a few people convinced Salvatore that it, maybe maybe we should opt into this a little bit slower. So it's an optional parameter. There's a new command called hello. So when I connect to a uh, Redis server, I can issue a hello command, and I can tell I can follow the hello command with the uh, version of RESP I want to use. So I can say hello space three, or, or I can send hello if I want to use uh, REST3 mode, or I can do a hello space 2 if I want to go to REST2 mode. Uh, when you're in REST3, there's no need to create a separate uh, TCP connection for invalidation messages because it can just send right through the main, it can send push messages right through the main connection. Uh, if for us at Pelasi, this is something uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, we use uh, multiple Redis clusters, and, and uh, if you're familiar with Redis cluster, um, the clients will connect to all the nodes of the clusters. And so in our case, we have, you know, all these clusters, we have all, <laughs> all these apps, each one is connecting to all the Redis clusters, not just, not just for, you know, get and set operations, but also for um, pub sub messages. And, and we have, uh, we just have just incredible number of connections uh, that personally, I would, I would rather see less of our port space being used up with uh, Redis connections. Downside with REST3 is that there's not a lot of support for REST3 yet in the clients. A couple, but but not a lot. Let's try and put this all together. Okay, so, so we talked about the client tracking. We talked about caching, client-side caching, and, and Redis caches. So so if I want to actually build a package that, that uh, does all this, what do I need to do? Oh, here we go. So on the client side, we're going to be creating an in-memory cache. We're going to create a connection to Redis. On that connection, we're going to enable client tracking. On a write, so, and then if someone wants to write to our cache, what we'll say is, is we'll update Redis, and then we'll update our in-memory cache, the client-side cache. Um, it's important, at least to me, to, to keep that order. Again, the, the whole concept behind this is, is that we've got this cache, and for this cache, Redis is the source of truth. So it's important that Redis always has the correct value. So I don't want to do the opposite. I don't want to write to my in-memory cache with this updated value and then go to Red, write to Redis and say, you know, there's a network blip. Someone tripped over a network cable. Something like that happened. And we can't update Redis because now we're in the case where the, the uh, client-side cache has the correct new value, but Redis still has the old value. We never want to be in that case. So I'd re always update Redis first, then update your in-memory cache. And uh, w if someone tries to read a value from your cache, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to look for it in your, your client-side cache. If it's there, good. We're going to just serve it up and we're done, or return it and we're done. If we don't find the value in our client-side cache, we're going to call Redis to retrieve the value. Once we pull that value from Redis, then we're going to update our, our, our client-side cache with that value we just pulled from Redis because next next time we get that uh, value requested, we want to just serve it up from the client-side cache uh, instead of having to do another Redis round trip. 
uh, one little caveat, and uh, another one that I kind of learned the hard way with our, our Paylassi solution, is is don't forget that that when you retrieve a value from Redis, so all these values have TTLs, you know, it's their cash values, and we want them to expire eventually. So in the case where we have a, a client side, where there's a read and there's a client side miss, miss and we have to go to Redis, grab the, T, the TTL, the remaining TTL on that key, because we want, when we write it to the client side cache, we want to mirror that that um, same TTL. So you know if the, if the value is going to be in Redis for three more minutes, when we put in our client side cache, we want it to remain there for three more minutes too. So when that three minutes expires, then... Um, you know, it expired out of the client side cache. We'll try to get from Redis. It's expired there, and then basically it tells tells the caller, "Hey, you know what? The value is no longer in the cache. You need to regenerate it. However, you do that, and then uh, then write it to us." Uh, and the last thing that you need is you, is you basically need something, some way to listen to invalidation messages from Redis. And whenever you get an invalidation message, um, you basically just evict the key from the in-memory cache. So then the next read is going to say, "Oh, not in in client side cache. We're going to hit Redis." So Pelasi, uh, it's what just if you're curious, what are what are our future plans with uh, with uh, um, client tracking? Uh, we're looking to use broadcast mode. Um, and I mentioned before, you know, in, in grand scheme of things, we have relatively few clients. We have a lot of unchanging data, rarely changing data in the cache. So broadcast actually works out well for us because there's, there's not a lot of need for us to store. Um, uh, just, there's just not a lot of need for us to have Redis track who's a requested value because, you know, with the web farm and stuff, over time, all the servers end up kind of asking for the same values or all the web servers ask for the same values. Um, broad, broadcast prefixes are, are uh, just a, a fantastic solution for us. We tend to build pretty big, beefy Redis clusters, and then we have uh, multiple applications that all, all share these Redis clusters. And so uh, when you do something like that, where you say you have, in our case, you know, 20, 25 apps, all sharing this Redis cluster, all the sharing the Redis cluster, you really need to uh, work with your key names to make sure you're not going to have conflicts because we don't want app one updating key that, oh, by the way, app 10 thought was using it and data changes completely. So we're all, we already have this concept of of all the values we write to Redis have a prefix, which is essentially the application code. So the prefixes work great for us. So like application one, when it establishes its connection to Redis, it'll say prefix you know, application one. And so only traffic or only key updates that are associated with application one will actually get broadcast to application one and not of the other, any of the other, um, any of the other uh, applications. Um, we really want to use the RESP3 clients. Uh, again, I'd mentioned, you know, we just we have a lot of lot of connections, a lot of TCP connections flying around. It would be great to be able to reduce that down uh, by not having to have these pub sub uh, channels. Also, we can just do RESP3, and we're getting then validation messages over the, the same TCP connection. Um, currently, we're using uh, Stack Exchange Redis, which is uh, used extensively through the uh, the .NET world. Uh, absolutely outstanding client, uh, super popular, super easy to use, incredibly fast. Uh, but I'm not quite sure what their plans are with, with REST 3. So I don't think they're going to have REST 3 support uh, very shortly. I may be wrong, though. Um, right now, if we don't find a client uh, with REST 3 support, we're, we're thinking about writing your own client. Um, because really, we have a, a very limited use case where you know we're just using this for caching. So we don't have to. We wouldn't have to implement a general purpose clients. Really, we just need to be able to get uh, support gets and sets and invalidation messages, which should make things a little easier. And finally, uh, I mentioned dot dot uh, Paylocity is a .NET shop, so that's we're typically using C sharp and stuff. And um, I did do a uh, little client tracking demo. So if you want to see some source to see how all this works. Here's the link to my GitHub repository. Again, this is a, just, it's, it really is a demo, very, very simplified, but it shows you what you need to do to make this all work. And with that, I thank you for listening to my presentation and have fun with the rest of the presentations at RedisConf uh, 2020 Takeaway. Thank you.